forms what we think of as the human world. Yeah. I'm already on fire. You can go. You know. So, so, so. You know. That's all I can do with you. I mean, obviously, I've left blood or understanding consciousness. You know, where I actually say something as opposed to introduce the areas. stars in the universe. 
Now, it's very highly interconnected and has a, a very clear structure. And for many of us, it so effectively controls our behavior that we can do things without thinking. So a lot of the stuff that we do is at a subconscious level. And then a certain amount of our experience is conscious. Now humans have two sides of the brain. The full brain, the hemispheres, is the most developed in humans as it is in any member of the animal kingdom. And we know that the brain has two sides. So the left side here, this is a, a rational, uh, problem-solving, analytical brain. It's, our, it, it's the, the, the problem solver and the narrator in our brain. The right-hand side uh, is responsible for more of abstract and intuitive thinking. And it is therefore our internal artist. It's our, it, it, it's our internal musician. Now, these two different sides of the brain give us a completely different way of uh, viewing the world. And this is really illustrated here. So here we have a, a, a sea um, scape here from the Isle of Wight. And you can see the left-hand brain, what it does is it looks at this picture and it breaks it down into its tiniest components. It says, okay, we've got a horizon, there's a cloud, there's a wave. And maybe it makes connections between the wave and, oh, perhaps I could have a swim. So a very kind of reductionist approach. On the right hand side, our right brain is really taking in the whole experience. And a lot of people believe that it actually captures a much more realistic impression of our experiences. So it's capturing that abstract, kind of that sense of, you know, you might look at that and see the rays coming down and going, you know, that, that, that's something that's very divine. So much more abstract, so very different ways of looking at the world. Now, what I want to do is a, a very quick experiment here. So if we look at this um, dancer spinning, who can see her spinning clockwise? Can you put your hands up if you see her spinning clockwise? And who, who can see her spinning anti-clockwise? Now isn't that interesting, we're all sitting in the, in the room, we're still all having the same experience, but we're seeing it very differently. Now the interesting thing about this little trick is if you see her spinning clockwise, that means you're perceiving her very much through your right brain. You see her spinning anti-clockwise, very much your left brain. So I think that gives us a little bit of uh, something to, to show your friends at a dinner party. So now let's look at states of consciousness and um, patterns of brainwave activity. So there's been a lot of research that has looked into the whole electrical activity of the brain. And here we have the example of the Tibetan monk who was very graciously allowed um, the experimenters to put uh, 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 electrodes on his head to, to perform an EEG recording. Now, when you do a, a, a recording like this from, from someone's brain, what you see is that there are actually four different types of brain waves. So we have delta waves, that's our kind of unconscious. We have theta waves, that's our creativity, and we see this a lot in young children. Then you have your alpha waves. This is your the state of uh, alert but relaxed awareness. And finally, you have your beta waves, and these are the ones that are associated with problem solving and strategizing and uh, you know, doing the crossword. <coughs> now what we see when we actually look at meditators is that we see that when people are meditating, they have an increase in theta waves and they have an increase in the alpha waves. So that's, that shows us that there's a, a relaxed awareness, but with an element of that kind of creative uh, elements of the beta waves, we also see a reduction in the beta waves. So there's a reduction in um, the uh, amount of thinking going on. Now Maxwell Hay is a guy who in the 1970s did some very pivotal research. And when they were still using very basic machines, he did recordings from people and he identified that 
there were different levels of consciousness. And that in these different levels of consciousness, that actually there were different brainwave patterns associated with that. So you can see, for example, dreaming sleep has high levels of theta, which is not surprising given the visual kind of sensory uh, content of your dreams. Uh, meditation associated with high levels of alpha waves. Now when you've got a slightly better machine, what he was able to do was measure the whole activity on either each side of the brain and came up with these patterns. So deep sleep, you have a lot of the low delta waves. So if you imagine the horizontal axis here is how much activity there is, and the vertical axis is how, what frequency of activity. So here you have dreaming in deep sleep, you have a lot of delta. As you move into dreaming sleep, you get more theta. As you go into waking sleep, you can see you have a lot more beta waves, but it's actually only concentrated there on the left side of your brain. And then meditation, you have this uh, alpha and, and theta peaks. Now, we also found um, what he called an awakened mind state. And in that awakened mind state, you have the alpha waves, you have the theta waves, but you also have the return of the beta waves. But the difference in this case is that, in fact, the beta waves are very balanced across both sides of the brain. So there's some element of brain synchronicity. So theta, alpha, and beta all increase in this awakened mind state. Now, um, Anna Weiser, who was uh, working very closely with Maxwell Cage, has continued this research, and she's actually recorded this awakened mind state in healers, in experienced meditators, in whom it's very much a permanent state that they live in. But then you also have um, this awakened mind state in artists, in composers, even CEOs in, in offices, you know, trying to pin down that latest business deal. And for them, it's a kind of a transient switch into this awakened mind state. And in all cases, it's associated with this kind of high performance and creativity. <coughs> so let's now look at functions of consciousness, or brain functions that are important for consciousness. So just a little bit of orientation first in terms of the brain. So the frontal lobe, that's here, the, 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 the front of your, uh, your head, is really associated with cognitive thinking you know, with, with, with attention, with strategizing. Then we have the parietal lobe here, which is kind of sitting above your ear. That's associated with a sense of self and non-self, a sense of orientation in space and time. And the temporal lobe here, this is the source of our, our memories, our long-term memories. So, you, you know, the, the repository where we have all these images and memories during uh, dreams or, or in fact meditation. Now these two guys in the States, Andrew Newberg and Eugene DeQuilly, they they decided what